Love Talk Radio. Welcome to Voices of Global Freedom Radio. We are broadcasting from San Diego, California, Saturday, February 21st, 2015. This is Roy Backpack Baron and our co-host Yoda. We bring our patriotic conservative audience news you can use and actionable tactics, methods, and strategies to survive and thrive in these dangerous, troubled times. We are honored to be syndicated with the popular radio networks, the Spark Radio Network, K98 Talk, and Top 5 News Picks on TopTalkRadio.com, along with Sean Hannity, Rush Limbaugh, and other household names. Yoda, how are you doing today? I am doing superior backpack, thank you. We have a stunning guest today, audience, that backpack rounded up somehow with the skills that he does. Joining us today from the frigid fields of southern Illinois, is one Brigadier General John E. Michelle, recently retired from the Air Force after a long, stunning, almost absurd career. People like General Michelle are Harvard and Stanford graduates. They're command pilots. They have truly been there and done that. From the battlefields of Afghanistan, He headed up a training unit there in an air refueling wing. He's a pilot in command with high hours. And just, we are so honored and privileged, Backpack, to have the good general with us. From the frozen fields of southern Illinois, here's General Michelle. Good evening, General. Well, Yoda, Backpack, and uh, to your listening audience, it's uh, it's an absolute privilege to uh, join you this evening. I appreciate what you all do with regard to uh, ensuring we can keep active dialogues around conservative values, which really, I believe, reflect what our nation is at its finest. So thank you. Thank you for allowing me to be here tonight. And I look forward to our conversation uh, between ourselves and our listening audience. If you will, sir, it's your show. We don't take talk show to mean that we should talk and let the guests sit there. So it's your show. We've got a a few questions for you, but otherwise we would like you to drive the airplane show, if you will, sir. I've given you a poor introduction. My apologies. I don't flatter, General, but I enjoy compliments. Your career is so stunning that I don't know where to begin. Tell us how you got started, if you will, sir, and and how the career went along a little bit. Well, thank you for that. No, I'd be it'd be uh, I'd be happy to do that again. I've been very, very fortunate. Uh, probably like you hear that probably from many on your show who are afforded incredible opportunities. Um, I was uh, a graduate of ROTC, where I had the great privilege of. Uh, um, going to school down in Texas, and uh, that was a wonderful experience. And uh, from there, uh, was commissioned and then set off to pilot training. And then I ran on a series of assignments, flying Lears to uh, C5s to uh, places like Dover, Delaware. Then was uh, grateful to receive an early assignment to the staff. And so all those early years were just getting a chance to be exposed to a number of things, logged many hours. Uh, and, and I'll tell you that almost the, the, my entire career, with the exception of a year, has been uh, in support of directly or indirectly some form of combat operations or peacekeeping operations. Uh, in 1990, uh, obviously, we were involved in uh, the first Gulf War, and so uh, I was a standardization and evaluation pilot and did a number of things in Somalia after Black Hawk Down. And then... Uh, where it really got to be exciting, however, is when we have the opportunity to lead, as you know. And uh, I had the great uh, fortune over 26 years to lead four different organizations. The first, uh, Tanker Squadron. The second, uh, tank it, Tanker Expeditionary Special Operations Group over some uh, undisclosed location in the Middle East following the activity of uh, September 11th. And then I went on to uh, lead a wing in transition from uh, larger craft to unmanned aerial systems or remotely piloted vehicles, which was very dynamic. And then a number of other great assignments to include some uh, wonderful excursions as a national defense fellow. But I have to tell you, 
the highlight of my career was my last assignment. And I was uh, fortunate to be the commanding general of NATO Air Training Command, responsible for leading 14 nations in the development of a sustainable, capable, independent Afghan Air Force. Nothing on that scale had been attempted in history. I was surrounded by marvelous men and women in a very, very dynamic environment. And I will simply say that uh, though it was a significant, uh, uh, there were significant hurdles to progress, our, what we achieved together was truly astounding. And uh, there was no greater privilege in serving our Afghan partners who were so hungry for the freedom that sometimes uh, individuals in America take for granted. As you know, their country has been devastated over the last 35 years. And uh, they, are, they really are hungry for real change. They want for their children the ability to go to school. They want to be able to have some basic level of mobility and access to a, just a very simple quality of life. And they worked hard. I see I literally uh, worked alongside them, uh, was a witness to a number of them giving their lives for their country. And I am so very fortunate to have led so many marvelous men and women. And to be honest with you, when it was time to uh, leave that assignment, I, I only returned about four or five months ago. Uh, and my choices were, uh, you know, to perhaps uh, move on to a staff assignment. I just felt that it was it was time now to transition and, and start putting our energy in some other areas that we can perhaps talk about later. So just thank you for letting me give you that quick recap. Uh, I'm grateful for the service. I've been surrounded by marvelous, marvelous people who are so dedicated, who are so selfless, and are an inspiration and made 26 years fly by because of the incredible positive example they set every single day. Bravo. Question, if you will, sir. What was the training regimen? What were you covering in training? So when training with the Afghan Air Force, we were developing uh, all elements of an Air Force, 119 different specialties. So we trained wow. everything from how to write contracts to how to fix aircraft to how to fly seven different systems to uh, think of a miniature version of the United States Air Force. That's why nothing on this scale has ever been attempted, much less in an active war zone. So we were every day mixing it up between actually, you know, teaching people the independent functions that are required to be able to make the operation self-sustainable. We were running English language laboratories because, as you're probably aware, only 5% of uh, the men and women in Afghanistan are English literate, and that is the language of aviation. We also helped even with their native uh, education as only 31% of the population of Afghanistan is literate. So we were running a series of concurrent things while fighting uh, the enemy. On numerous My occasions, word. we would, yeah, we'd have to assert the training to be able to now do what the nation of Afghanistan needed us in support for troops in contact, in support of special operations, or any other host. So you can understand why it was so absolutely dynamic. And uh, and again, our our results were again they, those were astounding, and uh, we were grateful. My last. Uh, three days before I retired, I was uh, afforded the privilege of, of accepting from the Secretary of Defense for our, our team's efforts in Afghanistan the uh, Secretary's Award for the best nation-building program in 2014 across the globe. So that's not necessarily as much a reflection on my leadership. It's a reflection of the incredible men and women who committed to doing that mission. And you can see I am so very proud of them. What a challenge, General. I, I don't want to get you out in the weeds with this. What kind of airplanes does the Afghan Air Force have? No, I don't think this is in the weeds. I mean, I think on a show like this and uh, in general, it is so so few people understand that, one, Afghanistan has an Air Force or why it's important that they continue to develop one. So with regard to the platforms, uh, at the time we were uh, – uh, developing MI-35 capability. So that's a hind. That's an attack helicopter akin to a, a Cobra. Uh, the core right. platform was the MI-17, as you're familiar with, for, from uh, you know another Russian platform, which is perfect for Afghanistan. We were training in the uh, uh, at the same time we were training them in the C-208. So we were teaching basic pilot training and then teaching the Afghans to train themselves on how to create more pilots as well as all the other type of specialties. And then we had uh, we were preparing for the A-29, which is a light attack aircraft. We had 
Uh, we, when I was there a month after I arrived, we received our first C-130s. So you can appreciate the significant capability that that provided for Afghanistan. We were training at MD-530s, and we have since added a uh, little bird capability, which occurred in the last four months that we were there. So we added uh, a dozen of those aircraft to be able to support troops in contact and to be able to ensure they had the respective kinetic capability they needed to, uh, uh, to do what their nation uh, required. And so you can see here there's a host of capabilities. So all those are going on. We're operating in six nodes across Afghanistan. Again, we're, we're fighting a very resilient enemy, but what I was really struck by is the commitment of our Afghan partners. You know, every day, 98.5% of that population we were training was, was relegated to public transportation. Um, they bravely got on those buses, and I say bravely, and came to work. because Did the Russians leave behind helicopters there? No, no, we bought them. General? We bought them separately. Oh, so sorry, they, audience. We must have lost a connection. Let us try to retrieve that immediately. What have we got here, Backpack? Uh, General John Mich Michelle, are you able to hear us? I got you guys loud and clear. I think we had a uh, technical issue here. General, if you will, if you copy this, please call back. I say again. General, okay. if you will, if you copy this, please call back. We don't know what happened here. Yeah, he's I calling back. Um, we can go ahead and go to a quick break, uh, station break. Uh, so impact on all While we're recovering the general, something happened technically, our apologies, audience. I want to tell you about Impact Analytics of Florida. Our good friend Tim Kalin, president of Impact Analytics, has started a skyrocketing already launch of a new site, a new tool for our fine audience called, what's it called? Back, back. Uh, punchingbagpost.com. I say again, punchingbackpost.com. Our good friend Tim Kalin, president of Impact Analytics, has put a brand new site together that collects the top ten conservative headlines and expands on them. He sends them out to email to subscribers, so you want to subscribe. In addition, he puts it up on his new site, Punching Bag Something What. PunchingBagPost.com. Uh, we're back with General John E. Michelle. How are you doing, General? Great. Apologize, guys. Not sure what happened. Can you hear us? Okay. Sorry about that. We had a technical difficulty. No worries. No worries. No, I got oh, you yeah. Right General, you. Okay, great. Uh, Told you, General. I can barely figure out a flashlight. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. It's all good. All right, I'm all right. glad to be back with you guys. Before it went away, I had asked you if the Russians had left behind helicopters in Afghanistan. And they did not. Matter of fact, uh, the NATO coalition and really the United States Congress authorized the purchase of, of MI-17. So, so the MI-35s were uh, came through other partners. They were actually through the Czech Republic. And the MI-17s, of which there were 58 of them, and then 30 of them with the Special Operations Unit that also flew that, that asset and uh, we worked with. They, uh, again, all appropriated through the Congress. I've trained, <clears throat> beginning in 1974, after the Munich Olympic massacre of Israeli athletes, we formed a firm in the private sector under the aegis of the U.S. government to train countries' new forming counter-terrorist units. I did that quite a while. We visited 110 countries in 11 years. We work with the world's evolving finest counter-terrorist team. But I can't imagine your chore of teaching them something as technical as aviation. I just can't get there. You did this in English, huh? Well, we did it, uh, again, we did it in English, but we also um, worked some, some opportunities where we could do this in uh in, in Pashto, 
or Dari. Um, we did not do it in, in, in Russian, although a good number of our Afghan partners, the more seasoned ones, their experience had been in training in Russia or with the Russian partner, so there was a good number of, of if you will, some of the older school pilots for, Af- uh, for uh, uh, Afghan pilots who were um, wow. very comfortable with Russian. Did you have Russian-speaking Americans? We had actually a number of folks from, remember, I had 14 nations working for me, so I had a number from Czech Republic and Slovakia and a whole host of others, so we had access to individuals that uh, absolutely spoke Russian. Although, again, the, the language that we that we uh, insisted on for the pilots when we were training and then how we, they developed their, their training capability was English, since it is the IKO language. Although when they fly right. together, they often speak in uh, Pashto or Dari. Another one of my accomplishments, I call them Yoda anecdotes, they're like anecdotes, is I failed Cantonese at the Defense Language Institute. <laughs> that was in addition to my failing an Air Force subject that I told you about off air. Sir, you have lit up our emails. I wonder if that didn't crash our system. You're already early in our program. We've got a lot of questions from listeners who are sending a bunch of emails. What have you got there back then? We have one listener from Roanoke, uh, Virginia, and they want to know what was it like being involved with 14 different nations with NATO? How did how were you able to manage all of that, or uh, or you know what were your challenges that you overcome and things that you experienced with that? That's an excellent question. Um, as you can appreciate, there were you know language barriers, although uh, you know most had some basic level of English. Uh, What I found is the same thing that has worked with, again, any kind of cross-cultural or or boundary-spanning team, and that is quickly finding commonality of purpose, creating every opportunity to ensure we had maximum uh, inclusion. And so we really went out of our way to uh, mixing the staff. It could have been easy, if you will, because the core group of people were Americans. Within our core headquarters staff, we ensured we integrated from all the various nations and showed we had a good diversity and that we created a whole series of ongoing opportunities to communicate uh, and even created uh, a series of uh, regular opportunities for socialization. So the point there is I went high team to be able to show that although we came from different places and we spoke different languages and had different cultures, we were united around a singular purpose of equipping our Afghan partners to be better tomorrow than they were today. And what we found is it really, really lit something that intrinsically with us as human beings goes back to what we were talking before the show started. When people know they're doing something that's noble and meaningful, then what happens is all that other stuff melts away and they show up and they give their best and that's exactly what they did. So, again, there was a lot of intentionality in how we wired the team together. Uh, We made it a priority to make everybody know that they played a critical role in exactly what that role was. And so it uh, it was truly an integrated team effort. Yeah, that's great. Uh, one of the questions that just came in from Chicago Illinois is about uh, Malala, who, Malala, who was uh, almost dead by the uh, Taliban in Pakistan, and uh, uh, all she was was simply trying to get an education. As we all know, she just got the Nobel Peace Prize, and she might be on track to be the next one of the next presidents of Pakistan um, from her experiences. Uh, have you run into that type of thing, uh, or what are your thoughts about her situation and how she's really risen up to do all these incredible speeches? She she gave a speech at the UN and um, when she got the Nobel Prize, and she's still very young, I think 17, 18. Absolutely. No, I saw it every day. Um, you know, not quite on, uh, although hers is an extreme scenario that played out on the world stage, the fact is that part of the world is hungry for tangible examples of hope and of courage and of people that are willing to say no to those individuals, those extremists who are trying to obviously hijack society and keep it, if you will, the individuals within that society repressed. So, again, she is an absolute bright spot. And every day I saw different individuals doing similar things. Let me give you a tangible story. I can't give you his name for purposes of security, but one of the biggest challenges we had in Afghanistan in building this Air Force is trying to drive transparency and increase accountability within the financial elements. As you know, graft and corruption is rampant in that part of the world. 
And Afghanistan relies almost solely on foreign donors. Matter of fact, the $4.1 billion the international community pledges every year to Afghanistan, uh, the constant pressures are due to this large-scale corruption. So we were trying to figure out a way to be able to work the budgetary process because just the Air Force I was building and I was responsible for is $6.7 billion. And we were running about a billion dollars through a year through these budgets. So what happened is we found out there was an Afghan colonel who came up with a system on his own working with a small team. And uh, they found a way to actually match requirements. And I won't get into the details. The important thing is they took the initiative they developed something that was really kind of savvy and integrate everything from videos. And we were really excited. So they took it to their leadership. And I will simply say that he did not need a warm welcome. Matter of fact, he was effectively banished. And so, however, uh, before he had to go on to his next assignment, we actually created something called the Order of the Penguin. The Order of the Penguin speaks to those who take, uh, you know, the metaphor for that first penguin that has to dive off the cliff there and is kind of the leader in which everybody else follows. He has to take or she has to take that risk. In this case, he took the risk, and we had a very public ceremony pitting on an award. And what happened by his example is a lot of other individuals who don't get regularly recognized in that society started to realize how much we appreciated things like innovation and the kind of difference it could make. And in the next month, we had more innovative ideas from the Afghan members of our collective group. There was 8,000 people in this Air Force. Um, than we had in the previous four years because this one man had the courage to step out, do something he knew was unpopular, and even though he had paid a personal and professional price for it and was forced to move to a much, to a, you know, not a good place in Afghanistan, his example inspired hundreds and really helped us lurch forward. So I hope that serves as a very tangible example of whoever it is, wherever they're at, people are looking for those who are courageous enough to be able to be a shining light. Uh, now that we've recently left Afghanistan and and folded up the flag officially and left, uh, you know, what are your thoughts about your predictions on the future and you know the next three four years of where is Afghanistan going to go? Well, let me just say, I mean, that's a great question. But remember, we haven't left. We have twelve thousand people there now, and we're going to be there uh, for the next couple of years. And uh, you've probably picked up in the news recently, even at the even from the White House, there's some, some conversations going on about is this, as prudent, is this a prudent path to remove, if you will, NATO forces and U.S. forces in their entirety from Afghanistan. When I arrived, one of the big challenges is we started the Afghan Air Force late. We didn't start until 2009, so we were only four years into this effort. Um, because of some you know, the political considerations and the other interests, what was supposed to, we were supposed to have until 2021 and then effectively we were asked to accelerate the growth of the Air Force by up to four years. Now, we were able to do some things, but the reality is this. Everyone recognizes that the ally of the Afghans is time. Time that is, if you will, provided for them by very capable partners, such as the U.S.-led NATO coalition. I saw firsthand what happens when you bring a lot of talented people from different countries and move them alongside the Afghans. I am also, we're also wise wide open after what we watched unfold in, Af in Iraq if we are not very, very, very diligent in how we withdraw our support. I believe in my humble perspective that that should be done alongside tangible timelines associated with benchmarks of performance. Otherwise, we do not want to risk squandering the precious you know, treasure in terms of not just money, most importantly, uh, the 2,500 plus individuals who have given their lives in support of this cause. So it's we're still there. We're still working hard. We're still making great progress because I stay plugged into the, to the people there. And uh, I'm hopeful we will have a responsible withdrawal over time. It cannot be abrupt. Well, I, I hope we've learned that recently in Iraq. If you so. had a mag <laughs> if you had a magic wand, General, what would you do in Afghanistan? What presence would you have there at this time? Well, I don't think we're gonna climb up in presence. I what I would do is I would instead of going along, I would offer arbitrary numbers in terms of when, you know, who's gonna be there when in terms of time frame. I go back to the point that I would say 
this is our mission. We've, we've, we've we had a very clearly defined mission. We're operating on a glide path just like in flying. And what we want to do is we want to ensure that the acceptance rate of the capabilities, that the Afghan's ability to organically be able to demonstrate the capability to effectively carry out these missions, and I'm talking from ground operations to special operations to aviation operations, and the whole life cycle, uh, that takes time. And I, and, and I would offer that should determine the prudent path to leave Afghanistan. And if it takes a little longer, from my view, it's more responsible to do that, not just for the Afghans, but to honor everyone who's been involved in this conflict or given a life for this conflict, than it is to just say, we're going to knock this out in 24 months, and then, you know, and we get what we get. I mean, that may be kind of an extreme way to characterize that, but that, to me, is not judicious. To me, that is not responsible. Well, it's absolutely a gift to the enemy, of course. It's it's absurd to advertise when you're going to leave, of course. Do you Absolutely. see ISIS? Do you see ISIS with any ambition towards Afghanistan? Well, again, it's only conjecture, obviously, which is all we can. But I think if you look at the, you know, ISIS is. I'll just use the word sophisticated on a couple of different fronts. We've shown that they have manifested in what eleven different countries now. So Afghanistan to that to, to me is just. I think if they have their way, they'll manifest everywhere they can. Remember, they're a terror group that plays as much in people's minds as they do physically in a space. And uh, it's, it's reflective in their incredible approach to use of social media and to how they understand news cycles. So they understand the psyche very well. Uh, matter of fact, I think we've seen some of these extreme you know, manifestations of their, I'll just say, just the kind of unfortunate, you know, uh, I want to use the word monsters because I just can't even think of any kind of group of, you're not even human when you can do the kind of things that they've demonstrated. I think they'd be happy to have a, have a play in Afghanistan at some level. And I think their ultimate goal, so, is to get a, to be involved in as many countries across the globe uh, that they can be. Uh, on a side question, sir, what do you see the chance of ISIS making attacks on, on the United States? Well, again, I don't know. Uh, I think we see in, uh, you know, in, the, in a world where it's, we have fairly, um, it's very easy to move around. We have, uh, there's a fluidity in our borders. I'll just leave it at that. If we, depending on which you know, perspective you choose to ascribe to, even here in the United States, um, it is very likely it's a very networked world, which means that there are, there could be sympathizers that grow from the inside out. The bottom line is this, um, whether it's ISIS or any other kind of group who wants to act out in, 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 a, in an ill way, um, I think that there's a, a great likelihood in the world that they they can exert influence here, negative influence here, just like they can exert it. We've seen it everywhere from Copenhagen to Paris to London. I mean, uh, again, it is a very unstable world, as you, you appreciate, because you, you've grown up in a time where we started with large standing armies. And, you know, the world, although... Personally, none of us who are involved in the military professionally are, you know, care for war. I mean, but that's just, you know, just a manifestation of, of, of life on this planet. And so when you take that, what we find is large standing armies and other things make things a little more predictable, right? What we have now in this fracturing and there's no longer, you know, the adversaries are no longer nation states, but splinter groups, one-offs, radicals, anybody who wants to put a label on themselves, and we saw it in Boston, didn't we? I mean, look what happened in Boston is a perfect example of what can unfortunately happen any given day. And that's why continued intentional investment in, in law enforcement, integrated systems and how various agencies continue to cooperate and communicate, how we continue to get real and perhaps very serious about how we work our borders. Um, that's the best that can be done. And I think it's, you know, the fact that we haven't had any uh, significant attacks Oh, since 2001, demonstrates that this country can do it better than anybody if we remain committed to it and will invest in it, my friend. And that's what I'm interested in seeing. So the long answer to the question, but it really begs a much larger perspective, and that is the world's more dangerous and unstable than it's ever been, which means we need a strat coherent strategy on how to deal with these things at all levels. 
and we need to all uh, we need to make sure and continue to hope and pray that our politicians invest in the right technologies, the right agencies, and do the right things. We work closely, General, with the Joint Terrorism Task Force and our other lights, <clears throat> and with insiders in major letter agencies, and they are virtually echoing what you just said, though not as eloquently I might reveal. We see it now as four threats simultaneously. One is the thousands of people fighting with ISIS now in Syria and Iraq who won't need visas to come back into the country. Most of them were raised here in a clandestine Muslim Islamic jihad mode in Dearborn, Michigan, Minneapolis, and elsewhere. Though they're among us, they live virtually self-appointed Sharia lives. The non-border is, of course, another threat. We work with border agencies. They have found ISIS flags and material on our side of the border in Arizona and Texas. We see ISIS itself, or elements thereof, coming in however they get here. So that's three of them anyway. So guys that know and gals that know a lot more than we do are predicting a short-term two, three-month attack here on the United States. <clears throat> they don't know how to protect how big, though Al-Qaeda, as you would know, always wants that big bang. They want to do something bigger than 9-11. Their planning cycle is seven years, and they've far exceeded that now since 9-11. Anyway, for audience benefit, the insiders, some of the whistleblowers that are quiet, and they don't blow whistles too loud, are predicting attacks on the United States within two or three months. Weather like recent Paris or Denmark or bigger, we don't know, of course. You, sir, are lighting up our board in the form of email. Isn't he back back? My yeah, word. we're getting a lot of responses here. And uh, one of the questions that came in is, uh, in war, do young people become more patriotic and serve their country? Well, I would say I don't believe it's the case. In fact, I believe war simply, simply makes it more immediate and compelling for those with a desire to serve a cause greater than themselves, to channel their passion, if you will, in a particular direction and towards a particular tangible end. You know, in reality, the history of the world confirms that you know, people, young and old alike, are willing to fight for a cause they believe in. So whether it's defending their nation or protecting those who can't protect themselves or striving to drive positive change in their surroundings, personally, I'm convinced that human beings yearn to live lives of meaning and significance, right? And when our cherished way of life is threatened, it only emboldens us to act on that innate desire. So really what war does, young and medium age and even old alike, is it really stirs up something within us that says, this is something that I am willing to stretch out possibly even put my, and put my life on the line for because it's something bigger than myself. And that's what America, that's why America is so amazing, is w many of us want to do that because this ideal, there's no other ideal like it anywhere. There never has been in the history of mankind. So I think just young people who are so hungry especially to find that cause, that purpose, war sometimes serves as that catalyst, if you will. But it's not just them. It's all people of character. <laughs> uh, leaders in civilian ranks uh, run for public office. Is the best foundation for leadership through military training? I think, uh, I think certainly, well, of course, now admittedly I'm a little biased in here, but I certainly think that, uh, uh, that military training affords some pretty incredible opportunities for, you know, you gentlemen would know, um, what happens when we bring disparate individuals in, you know, from all walks of life, we quickly enculturate them around this concept of team, right? We, sus we get them to suspend, if you will, their self-interest to be able to connect to other people and for a cause, again, bigger than themselves. And so what happens over time is we learn and we inculcate skills in the military, such as self-discipline, self-control, the value of teamwork, the importance of communication, 
So we could list all those. And by the way, you know, people don't have to go to fancy schools to realize that it is all these kind of characteristics that we yearn for because that's actually reflective of high-performance organizations. Whether you're running a business, a nonprofit, you're trying to actually, you know, spread your mission through a church, it doesn't matter what your role is. Those characteristics that are paramount to operations, effective operations in the military, that we actually intentionally develop very, very well in all members of the military, regardless of rank or service, I think are invaluable. And I think they really qualify military people very well. Now, don't get me wrong. It doesn't mean those can't be developed in other places, and they do frequently through civilian society. But I think what we've seen, going to your point, when you use the word political office, um, I think more than anything what the military does is it looks to mold people into citizen leaders of character and what people want in their leaders, especially if they're making the laws or supposed to be setting an example, is to be beacons of hope and light and, i.e., people of character. <laughs> so I feel personally, not just because of my 26-plus years, I want people of character to, to be leading me. I think Americans want that. And I think when they see the military, they believe they get that. We're both very active on social media. I have an account called My Human Compass, and uh, your account is uh, John E. Michelle. Uh, at, and one of the big questions that's come up, I, I see several areas that's kind of uh, in the American way. Some people are calling for America the Republic and that we stay as a republic, and other people are saying America the Empire, and it's like a tug of war. And then we have the tin hats that are saying that you know, we're all part of the United Nations. You know, these are all different things that um, are pulling at the, you know, what the social media is when you study it. You know, what are your thoughts about all these three different things that are pulling? You know, how much should we stay as the Republic? You know, how much is the Empire? And then the Tin Hats that say that we're all part of the United Nations. Well, that's an interesting perspective. I really appreciate you bringing that up. You know, I think it's just like with a family or a marriage or is we got to get home right first. What I mean by that is the United States of America, before it needs to be, in my view, you know, going off and, uh, and doing things outside its borders, needs to ensure that we're, we're operating consistently within what are the priorities of this nation, that we're operating effectively as a group of people. And there's a lot of ways that you can, you know, people can come up with determinants of what that is. But it has to be working at home first. So we need to make sure that uh, we continue to invest the right talent, the right bandwidth, the right energy into the structural elements of our society, the political elements of our society, the economic elements of our society. And there are plenty of challenges right here at home. So the fact there is I think we have to make that investment and if uh, and in their times of, if you will, uh, whether it's through a recession or tough times, then we, it's a disproportionate investment internally. However, we cannot... Uh, you know, we have to be eyes wide open in the fact that we are also the only nation in the world that does the kind of things that we can do economically, militarily. And so we have a larger responsibility because that's what leaders do. They take responsibility for aiding others across the globe. I am a firm believer that this very blessed nation was designed at exception to be a light, to be an example to the world. That is not an elitist statement. That is to say, we could set an example that others then, and I, you know, could would want to emulate. And if you look at our history with immigrants flocking here from the very first days, if you will, that this nation was founded, I think that for many years, you know, you know that we, we succeeded there. You know, now the world is a very dynamic place. So I think America has to continue to step up to some level of responsibility to lead on the world stage, but it did not need to do it alone. The world is also needs to be uh, it needs to be more collaborative than it's been before. We need to have more people vested in their own gang. That's one of the big critiques, if you will, of what's happening in the Middle East right now. Is it's a, I know it's a dynamic situation because you've got various Islam elements of Islam that are, you know, in countries are right out there. But the reality is everyone has to have skin in the game in the kind of an interconnected world in which we live. So we have to get it right at home. We have to be appropriately and, you know, responsible for uh, using our influence well across the globe. And then within that, if you will, yeah, there'll, there'll be opportunities where you know, America then will, will may be called on uh, to lead. And historically, we've done well. I would, uh, I would say that uh, you know, 
right now, I think the, the world finds itself in a very dynamic place, and I think many look to America for some level of leadership. And in some instances, uh, you know, it uh, it may be may be challenging in 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 in, in what they're hearing or saying. We're going to take a brief break with uh, General John E. Michelle, and we'll be back shortly. Energy efficiency pros, EE pros, solutions that save you money. Are you a commercial business looking to reduce costs on your energy bill? Replacing traditional light bulbs with LED results in tremendous savings every month. Commercial, industrial, and manufacturing facilities from coast to coast are saving up to 90% on their skyrocketing costs of energy. Energy costs are rising every month, but using EE PROS lighting saves money, time, and will bring you happier employees and customers. For a free audit and evaluation of your facility, contact Don Arrigo, president of EE PROS, EE Pros, at 480-585. 9161. Tell Don that Backpack of Voices of Global Freedom Radio referred you. Yoda, have you had some experience with this? I have a Yoda anecdote like an anecdote. A friend of mine in Chicago <clears throat> converted to LED, whatever that is, and is saving a fortune. It seemed too good to be true to him. He's a, one of our surviving manufacturers, has a large underground parking lot and lights throughout. And he can't believe his first and second month savings. So back to you, if I had a manufacturing hospital, parking lot, anything commercial or industrial, I'd sure give Don a buzz. Thanks, Backpack. Uh, go to eepros.com. I say again, eepros.com. We're back with General John E. Michelle, United States, United States Air Force. Uh, one of the questions came in is, a lot are in the public eye. If you can name current military leaders, is this due to media coverage or a larger cultural appreciation for military leaders? Um, I think if, if I want to make sure I understood the question correctly, that there are a lot of senior military leaders in the public eye, and is that is that as a result of, you know, is that an intentional or is that uh, – a function of the fact that they uh, they enjoy some level of popularity with the American people. Was that the question? Yes. Um, well, I think there are. I mean, this is a really interesting balance, though, right? Um, I know because uh, I just happen to be, you know, as you know, pretty prolific in social media. Matter of fact, uh, I'm the most, uh, I'm the top social media influencer in the Department of Defense. And I only share that because I think we have a responsibility as senior leaders, especially in uniform, to be able to stay connected to the men and women we serve. There's been uh, it's been challenging, and there's been a lot written about the fact that many believe that the military has become somewhat separated from the very population in terms of you know understanding, and I don't the population appreciates the military, but there's not necessarily the level of uh, of dialogue and, and understanding that perhaps once existed. With that said, uh, I think we see more senior military leaders uh, working to be able to forge those connections, to be able to have that conversation to be able to uh, connect to the men and women by which, again, they've raised the right hand to support and defend the Constitution, but really that Constitution exists in support of the population. And so there are a number of high-visibility folks, but where we have to be careful, we in the military, is uh, you know we work very clearly under civilian control. We uh, can articulate perspectives, opinion, and facts, but uh, you know we, we do not – get overtly involved in, in political issues. Uh, now, some when folks retire, they do, and that is their prerogative. However, um, you know, a lot of, military, of, the, of the high visibility people that you talk about, their goal is to create an unfiltered means of communication to the American people as to what they stand for, to be able to help them understand, you know, the priorities of the department, because every single American has a vested stake in the success of defense. That's really a pretty straightforward statement. And we want a strong defense. We want to have the ability to be able to know that if anything, uh, any type of uh, of anyone were to arise, internal, external, 
that we have the capabilities to be able to uh, um, to deal with it effectively and efficiently and swiftly. And that said, it's important. I think it's I think it should be an absolute priority, remain a priority, that American senior military leaders remain in conversation at whatever level they can with the 300 and some odd million people that they serve. We're accidentally forming a general officer club general of retired generals. One is General Vallely, retired Army, who is delightfully outspoken about his current perspective of what we're doing and not doing against ISIS. Another is Brigadier General Audino, who was embedded with Kurds in northern Syria and Iraq. He's equally outspoken in his opinion of what we should do and we're not doing here not doing nearly enough against ISIS now. We we have these fellows on air, and they're doing a great job, as you are, sir, at communications, really. Back to you, Becca. Another question has been, uh, corp- what can corporations learn from the military and the Department of Defense entities? Well, I think for you know corporations today, we talked about some of that a little bit ago with regard to uh, – um, you know the kind of skill sets they get when they um, when they bring on military, you know, ex-military members. Um, so you know, corporations, you know, what they can what they can realize, if you will, from military members is the fact that they get an individual who is, you know, a team player is somebody who is can be trusted to not just show up, but to actually exist at tangible value. As you know, one of the things we work really hard to instill within the military is to not accept mediocrity. That is, you know, we're be given a mission and we're going to achieve that particular mission, but along the way, we're going to continue to look for new and novel ways to be able to get it done and to do it in a way that everyone can benefit from. So I certainly think that the military, you know, the emphasis we place on the development of people is really the proverbial secret sauce of what sets us apart. You know, I think we do, again, a wonderful job of cultivating leaders of character with relevant life skill to succeed in a fast-paced, ever-changing world. You know, it's interesting. Years ago, I came across a piece by an unknown author that really resonated with me as to what it means to succeed as a leader. And this is what businesses want, leaders. And that is what they relay to when the the true efficiency report, if you will, when we talked to you, this story was talking about how the skills that really have set uh, military battles and military organizations who have succeeded in doing hard things apart was the almost uncanny ability for people to be empowered at all levels of the organization. We've all probably seen it or heard it, right? Like the strategic corporal. We remember seeing early days in Afghanistan of the picture of this, you know, this person who was not even a sergeant and they're on horseback, but what they were doing had, had international implications. And so the fact is, I think what businesses really can learn is when you distribute power throughout an organization and provide clear communication, mission orders, and trust people to really, you know, execute and look for ways and, and have opportunities to explore how they take their unique talent and bring it to bear, it's incredible what can be done. And we do that well because we depend on everybody. It isn't colonels and generals who get the things done. We know it happens down in the trenches, and we trust and empower them like no other business I've ever seen. So I think how's that for a lesson for businesses is, hey, how can we def- create a spirit of diffused empowerment across your organization? And uh, and anybody you have in your organization that's been part of the military will be key to helping make that happen. I found, General, you graduated Stanford and Harvard. What a resume, my work. I found in the symposiums that the military often invents, creates sophisticated management systems, including management by objective and management by exception. I found then that business institutions, Harvard, Stanford, Northwestern, pick up the military system or doctrine and then relate it or transition it to the civilian corporate world. 
you're a veteran of that as well. Have you seen that, sir? You know, I think that there are certain elements uh, because what the military does is we operate, as you know, uh, in a very disciplined way. I mean, just the nature of what we do, we want it to be disciplined. So to us, things like standardization and evaluation of things like training and so and all these elements that allow us to operate again in a disciplined fashion. So what, what, what you know, these type of systems we develop now allow us to kind of manage in mass and always for the goal now of how do we take and render the right effect at the right place at the right time. So again, there's, a, there's some sophistication there. Business is like that because there's certainly an applicability. Um, and we saw early on, you know, kind of the, you know, the, the, the corporate model that really emerged from the 50s on that drew, the, that really formed the framework of how many of the large corporate titans, uh, you know, over the last six decades came out of the military arrangements uh, from World War II, and those were carried forward, and they were refined over time. That said, however, those elements that provide uh, the ability, again, to move information fluidly, to make decisions really at the edge of the battle space, that allow us to operate disciplined fashion at all levels, those are, um, those are very attractive. What we have found now businesses diverge is the top-down command and control hierarchical structures, however, aren't resonating as much in many of the workplaces. Matter of fact, we're finding due to the fact this is the first time in history that we have four generations in the workplace, um, due to the fact that we have such, it's so competitive and technology is game-changing, you know, every day. And so there's a fluidity of operations also in the business space now that has actually kind of compressed this desire or this, this, this need to operate, if you will, in some of the more traditional forms that historically were adopted from the military. So where I'm going with this, is the military continues to be able to provide innovative ways to, again, drive and infuse discipline throughout a force for execution. Businesses continue to look for the mechanisms and adopt those. But where, again, we see businesses where they're having to invest a lot of time and energy is finding out how do you engage these various people because we know the workforce is kind of messy because you have, again, all different people with different needs and desires and motivations. And what that means is a lot of the people today are asking for greater autonomy, greater flexibility. They're asking for the ability to be more involved. I actually think that's great, but that also then speaks to a kind of a different, flatter, more diffused means of approaching power. And so we've seen a shift, and I personally think it's a good shift. Define the, define the shift, if you will, simply, General. We have a Question from Scottsdale. So top down uh, command and control doesn't work. Here's the bottom line. The command and control mantra, although there is certainly a need for it still in the military at times, um, it doesn't work well in the vast majority of businesses. Matter of fact, I mean the real vast majority. We now need we see a more popular, more appropriate means is a more diffused type where you can move information very quickly. You can trust people now to be able to do their role. You have to give them a little more space and latitude, um, all those elements. So, again, top-down hierarchical is kind of out. So is, you know, a very command and control type of leadership. People want a more empowering, trusting, almost transformational means of leadership. And, uh, and they want to be able to be in the conversation regardless of what level they are in a corporation. And so, uh, again, it's a much flatter type of orientation than we've ever seen. And that's what's fundamentally changed from the large-scale kind of military model that really hit the – that really kind of drove the architecture of the marketplace in the 50s to the 60s and beyond. And in the last 10 to 15 years, uh, that architecture had been, has been significantly reworked by really uh, kind of innovative companies that you probably hear about, the Zapposes and what we hear about, a lot of these startup companies that are into transparency and a lot of elements that aren't necessarily – aligned with the more traditional ways that we tend to think of top-down oriented companies and organizations like the military. Backpack, I have three, four requests that the general stay on with us for the next 30 minutes. Can we talk them into that? Yes, we can. Uh, Voices of Global Freedom Radio, uh, Brigadier John E. Michelle, United States Air Force, uh, you're an expert in organizational behavior and culture. Uh, what attributes to both working in public and private sector in the military and as civilian 
are worth adopting and sharing among our business cultures? Well, that's, again, that's a, that's another uh, another very good question. Um, I will tell you, uh, I'll just list off a couple here, okay? I'll riff off a couple, and then if the crew out there wants to uh, me to hit on, on on unpack a little more, I'll be happy to do that. So for one, and this, and I always start. It may seem obvious, but people tend to forget it all the time. Remember, leadership's about people, not things. Okay, technology is. I get technology can make things look sexy at the end of the day, and and it's maybe really neat gizmo, but it's people who deliver on the mission. So leaders have to be willing to um, set an example and taking smart risk. We know today those who experiment, those who innovate, those who will actually risk, in, and that means there'll be failures along the way. Risk taking is equivalent, directly proportional to success today. So take risk. Um, we have. Uh, the concept of co-creation and collaboration is an absolute priority. I hit it on, on it a minute ago. Um, no matter which organizations I'm involved in, you know, most folks who understand organizational dynamics, and especially when you, you look at those type of approaches that have a long track, a successful track record of bringing out the best in people, co-creation is essential. That means people have to be involved in the conversation all along. This notion that the leader can just set the vision and pass it down through a memo and expect people to execute on that, uh, personally, I'll say that it doesn't work. You know, the, the leader gets to set a general, you know, overall direction. We can call that a vision. But the really smart ones then go back to the people, involve them in refining that and then defining the path forward on how they're actually going to deliver on that. People have to be involved early and along the entire journey. You know, we have to keep in mind the customer is the common ground. You know, so we get caught up in processes and all these other elements that drive the business model. But the reality is we measure value through what we're delivering to somebody in terms of a product or a service. So it, people are in, businesses are in great peril when they take their eye off the customer. One of the biggest areas that I see is failure to demonstrate clear intent. Really good leaders and good organizations may have clear expectations and routinely communicate clear intent to the people throughout the organization of what they expect of them, what they're demanding of them, what people can expect from the leader, and exactly what their priority is in this moment. So often we set people on a direction, and they're off thinking they're doing great things, but the reality is the marketplace has changed. They just didn't get the memo. And this leads to a lot of dissatisfaction, a lot of disengagement. You know, tonight, I was just checking these statistics yesterday. In the United States today, only 29% of people are engaged in the workforce. In the workforce, only 29% of the people are actively engaged. Across the globe, only 13%. What does that tell you? These notions of inclusion, collaboration, how you actually get a little more progressive and how you, how you approach executing on mission are more important than ever, and it tells me that not a, a lot of people are doing a great job at it <laughs> because a lot of folks are waiting to get in the game, but they're still sitting on the sidelines and haven't been compelled to do so. So how about if we leave it at that and see if some people want to go to a finer point on some of those? One of the things Yoda and I discuss quite frequently is the uh, vast majority of people living quiet uh, desperation, li lives of quiet desperation. You know, what what are your experiences with that, Yoda? Oh, that's <clears throat> one of my favorite philosophers, though we find that a lot. Adding to what the good general is saying, they're not communicated with, they, they don't have a clear intent. I'm going to steal that from him and use it forever. <laughs> a lot of companies, civilian organizations we encounter, half the people seriously don't know what the other half want to do or are doing. You ask four departments what they're doing, and they can't, with clear intent, describe what they are doing, what the company is doing. That, I'm going to use those two words forever, General. You have really no, lit up the board. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're welcome to it again. It's just, uh, you know, I think, as you know, especially with your background, that one thing we are really, really good at in the military is what do we start with, right? We start with commander's intent. Everything goes from the fact that what are we trying to do here, how are we going to get, how, what does success look like, and then we build a path that lets everyone know how important their role and responsibilities are. I mean, we look at that and go, well, that should be straightforward. Wow. I, when I go out and talk about this with businesses, there's a lot of note writing because this almost seems like I delivered the next round of the, you know, the, of, the, of the tablets from the mountain. Well, actually you have. 
plagiarism is plagiarism is copying one person. Copying a lot of people is research. So I'm I'm, I'm stealing a lot of your stuff here, and I'm going to call it research. What are you? What now that? Now that you're out of the military, I wouldn't dare say retired. I believe you'll oh, never no. be retired. I'm sure I'm 77, and I call it the R word. I'm sure not. What are your plans now, good general? Well, thank you for asking that question. So a couple of different things. Um, we have a foundation that we actually uh, started building a year and a half ago. It's called uh, uh, so the, the, the General Leadership Foundation, and our website which is uh, www.generalleadership.com, is actually was just voted last week a number seven leadership uh, blog in the world. And uh, what we do there is we've collected all, very senior military leaders across all the services. The requirement to get in is you have to have commanded multiple times. So we have colonels, command chiefs, admirals, only that's, that's who, uh, who we're involved with. And so we spent a lot of energy there in building this group. We are now writing for places like Military Times, and, our, and we're really starting now to uh, provide an advice service to businesses. But what I'm excited about in the initiative that we were committed to working over the last year and we're going to launch on the 4th of March is what we call Mentors Matter. And what we're about to do is we uh, partnered with a technology uh, uh, teammate called Nefris.com. And uh, we are connecting veterans to young people in classrooms to teach three topics, leadership, character, and civic responsibility. When the government approved and instituted Common Core, those three elements fell out. And for us, there's nothing more frightening than the thought that we're not exposing the next generation of leader to what really matters and forming the foundation of who they are and should be as people. I guess they can think and do a math problem, but that, we all appreciate, isn't going to be what carries America into the next 100 years. So we're in 7,000 classrooms. We're, our goal is to grow to 100,000-plus in the next two years. And uh, the best part is I'm fortunate to sit on the board of directors of the Center for American Values out of Pueblo, home of America's Medal of Honor recipients. And we, have used, we are using character and leadership curriculum developed by Medal of Honor recipients as the guide for our veterans to be in conversations with our young people in classrooms using technology. So that is our, has been my immediate focus, is wiring that together to get a large-scale penetration that has not been achieved before of, uh, of real accomplished leaders giving back now, if you will. And we've got folks on active duty. We'll have folks who are retired. It doesn't really matter. Our next initiative then following that is getting veterans under vet to vet Connect to get the people who are mentoring and volunteering via that technology to go the other way and to reach out to veterans who are relegated full-time to veteran homes because I think we can do a better job of being able to connect to them and thank them for their service and to be able to tap their wisdom. So what you can see is a long pipe with general leadership kind of in the middle of it that extends from the veteran who is in the veteran, you know, uh, a long-term care facility now who has served for a long time and we want to learn from them and let them know we care for them. And then on the other end, it goes all the way to the classroom to the next veteran, a uh, potential veteran, more importantly, the next young citizen leader that is in some public school somewhere. So that's for a start. How in the world did you get in all these classrooms? Well, fortunately, we've been working with some folks for some time. And when I specifically found my technology partner, we were looking for someone who had created really unique technology that, one, is really easy, and, two, that already had penetration with the kind of people that we wanted to work with. And so Nephris, uh, they originally are focused on – they're originally built around this concept of, of STEAM, right? And so they're, what they do is they facilitate experts in the fields of science, technology, engineering, the arts, and math, let's say – a teacher in a classroom wants a paleontologist. So what happens is Nefris has made a system now where people can register to be a mentor expert on the outside, so from businesses and schools and wherever, and you list your kind of specific skills. Teachers 
can actually say, these are the kind of th- topics I want to talk about and skills I want my expert to have. And they created t- very cool technology that connects those two, sends an email, and it's one button you touch, and the mentor is in the classroom on the designated day at the designated time. So we partnered with them because we said, well, that's great, but we, no one is doing the same thing with education and leadership and civic responsibility. And they said, absolutely. So they expanded their, their, their program. They were in, at the time, 5,000 classrooms. Uh, we partnered with them with the goal of now helping them scale. We're bringing all the veterans or the means for veterans to register, but what we're also doing is leveraging our, our various platforms, our marketing, to continue to grow across classrooms. And again, as of tonight, Necros has about classrooms. And I shared our goal is very aggressive because uh, we cannot allow young people in classrooms to not be exposed to the very things that really make them productive citizen leaders. And again, math and all that stuff is important. Science got it. I don't think any of us in the future want to be led by people who are really smart but have the social skills of a gnat or have no character at all. Uh, Brigadier John E. Michelle, Voice of the Global Freedom Radio, please stand by. We'll take a short break and we'll be back with you. This is Backpack. We want to tell you about a brave American hero, Brigadier General Ernest C. Audino, United States Army retired, currently serves as Senior Advisor to the Kurdistan National Assembly of Syria. He also serves as Senior Vice President of Radon Corporation. General Audino.wordpress.com. I say again, General A-U-D-I-N-O.wordpress.com. And he's been a frequent guest on Voices of Global Freedom Radio. We've had him on a couple times with the President of Syria and Kurdistan. Yoda, are we privileged to be working with General Audino? My word, we are. Now we're on with an Air Force General mission. These people are incredible backpack. We- Civilians, if you will, in, in if that's received as condescending, so be it. Civilians have no idea of these heroes and their stunning, ridiculous accomplishments. As you said, the good General Audino was embedded with a small team, lived, ate, fought in combat with, decorated, and wounded, embedded quite a while with the Kurd element in northern Syria, and wandered off into a wreck, quite a guy, one in millions, as is our current guest backpack, back to the good General Michelle. So, General, um, one of the questions that's come in is, what can we do better here for our veterans of war coming back to the United States? Thank you very much for asking that. Um, I'd offer that... You know, I think our nation is very generous for its veterans. This is evidenced by the slew of programs that exist to assist with meeting virtually any need you can think of, right? However, my hope is America will not let its interest wane or attention wander when the current war in Afghanistan and looks like, you know, part two in Iraq becomes a distant memory. As you most certainly appreciate, many who have served on the front lines are still going to are going to be struggling with the reintegration for a long time, with healing and with a host of other challenges for decades, if not for their entire lifetime. So I guess ultimately my hope and prayer is America will be there for them no matter how long it takes. Uh, The scars of this will not, uh, as we know, they never fully go away. Uh, We're seeing this is, uh, these are the longest sustained conflicts in our history. And we have already significant levels of issues with PTSD. We lose 22 veterans a day to suicide. Um, There are significant challenges. We're going through a massive drawdown in the department. I'll be candid with you. I actually think that we have even more challenges coming up, coming up with regard to how we care for our veterans. So now is the time for, for really bold leadership, in the, not just in the VA, but all levels of government. I think more importantly, it's time for Americans to understand this is a long-term commitment. And uh, I'm just prayerfully hopeful that uh, we will make that commitment because uh, we know that, uh, that these, you know, all those individuals who are struggling – deserve nothing less from the people that they actually served. Should you get out of our way, General, it would be my pleasure to take you to the VA Hospital La Jolla, assisted by adjoining Center of Excellence, UCSD. I've made a lot of friends there over the years. 
I have, in my opinion and experience, the finest care in the world. They've kept me vertical without a tag on my toe and dirt on my face for the past 15 years. My primary physician who we're having on is named Dr. James Mickelson. Other specialists there, a friend, head of pulmonary ICU and critical care, Dr. Judd Landsberg, are extraordinary individuals dedicated providing exceptional care. Our editor-in-chief of the Magnified View, Janorama, has some of the finest insurance that you could buy. We are in an intense medical area here, and her care, no matter how hard we've tried, simply doesn't equal the care I get at the VA in La Jolla. So I'd love to introduce you around there. It's the exception to what we're hearing about the bad people in the VA, certainly the system, in its enormity. I think that they treat 6.1 million veterans a day or some astounding figure like that. Anyway, would love to have you out here and introduce you to the fine folk at the VA La Jolla. Back to you, Becca. Yeah, so as far as uh, takeaways for our audience today, what are some of the major areas that uh, our listeners need to uh, really digest so I, you know, again, thank you for that. And as we get ready to wrap, at least uh, you know my part as of your guys' show tonight. Let me just thank you again for including me. Uh, to Yoda, going to the point. Uh, if when I'm out there, it would be a privilege to spend time with you guys and get out there to uh, see those in the um, in the VA uh, facilities. I mean, it's I think it's it's a lifelong responsibility. All those those who have served in uniform for a career um, should have. And uh, so I look forward to that whenever my travels take me that way. So what should you know? What are the takeaways? You know, one, I'll start with kind of how we started the show with regard to Afghanistan. Uh, there are There is so much positive progress being made in Afghanistan. I guess where my heart is a little heavy is the fact that we couldn't even tell there's still a war going on over there by virtue of what we see on TV here. That said, um, let me tell you, having just returned there from uh, having spent the last 13 months there and returning just four or five months ago, um, people would be astounded at how much, how much good is occurring. I mean, yeah, there's challenges, and yes, there's a resilient enemy, but uh, the commitment of the Afghan people, I personally am a a huge fan. Um, They want a better life. Uh, We, the coalition, have made an incredibly uh, powerful, positive difference, and uh, I believe we need to do what we can to ensure that we do the job and we finish the job right. The Afghans deserve it. All those that have served deserve it. So Afghanistan is an emerging bright spot if we stay the course. You know, two, we had some conversations about the kind of things that, you know, businesses can learn and other things uh, related to skill sets. What's important is uh, we have a lot of talk about hiring veterans, but at the same time, I also read statistics about there's a certain amount of concern. You know, there's a number of, of, of employers who are worried or we've sensationalized so much some of the elements associated with PTSD that I think we've kind of convoluted the conversation some. So for anybody who might be listening who's an employer, I would tell you, um, yes, do your regular screening and the things that you do and how you would hire anybody, but you will get a disproportionate positive return on investment for every single veteran you hire. I believe that we should give veterans an opportunity. I'm excited to see that every day people come up with continued innovative ways. Just read today, New York is opening up a whole series of uh, taxi cabs exclusively to veterans. Um, and so you know, we, it's going to take it's a team sport to reintegrate this many people as we start to wind down, as we wind down this, this, this long, long series of war overseas. So veterans will be, uh, they will bring great teamwork. They will bring incredible hard, hard, you know, great work ethic. And uh, I think they will be a significant value add. So point two, give veterans a chance. I think you'll love the fact that you did. And last but not least, you know, businesses have a lot of different ways that we continue to look to, to improve operations. In addition to the foundation, I'm just now starting to align with some businesses to possibly do some things with them to help them be more efficient and effective and along those lines. Uh, if you take one thing away, it would be every opportunity to involve the members of your organizations at the, along the entire journey. That means everything from 
how you work strategic planning, to how you communicate goals and expectations. Inclusion is in, (laughs) more than ever, especially with the young millennials. The reason I think we have so many disengaged people in the workplace is we're not being creative enough in thinking how can we allow people to express autonomy, how do we let them know their voice matters, how do we reward them in a simple way. Can studies prove that the vast majority of things people want to be rewarded for their work, 86% of them have nothing to do with money. They want to be said, you know, good job. They want someone to simply acknowledge them tangibly. They want a handwritten thank you note. It's astounding how much we just leave on the playing field, and none of it is technically sophisticated. None of it is expensive. So my last point would be find creative ways to engage and trust and ask your people to be part of the ongoing organizational conversation. Give them clear intent. Give them the tools to do the job and then trust them enough to get out of the way. And I think in the vast majority of times, people will be very, very pleased with the outcome. So there you go, gentlemen. There's my wrap-up, if you will, of our of our conversation tonight. I have to tell this quick uh, inspirational story. I was on a recent flight from Phoenix to San Diego. I get off the airplane, and a veteran was there. He had two artificial limbs, legs, and he was going strong with a service guide. And uh, 22 years old, he must have returned from Iraq or um, Afghanistan. And boy, what, it sends a chill up my spine to see that. Uh, have you seen other soldiers in that sort of thing where he's still going? He's going at it, going strong. Oh man, I tell you what, they, they, I'm so inspired. That's part of the other reason why we wanted to do Mentors Matter, which is to create a way using technology to get veterans in the classrooms, is because of those who are mobility challenged. Um, right after I returned from Afghanistan, I had the good fortune of joining my friend David Webb in New York uh, for an event hosted by the Siller Foundation, who have now raised over $45 million for wow. not just uh, those from uh, the widows and, uh, and the family members affected by September 11th, the firefighters, because they lost their brother in that. But the vast majority of those dollars have gone to build homes for multiple amputees. So I had the opportunity to spend... Uh, the day there, downtown uh, New York, being part with the family and the and these incredible heroes. We had 40,000 New Yorkers out there celebrating with us at the end of a 5K run. Um, you spend five seconds with them. Anybody who is not inspired, I, I can't even find a word to describe you. You must not have a pulse or you're a communist because uh, uh, the reality is, you know, the adversity <laughs> they have to go through every single day, you know, the kind of things that they uh, – uh, we so take for granted you take one glance and realize, oh, my gosh, you know, we are blessed for those of us who are still have full functioning. But you know what? They never complain. All they talk about is how do I give back? How do I serve? How do I get back in the game? I want to continue to have meaning. Wow. It almost, it almost brings me to tears just thinking about these marvelous Americans. So, you know, here's the point. Thank you for sharing that. You know, what kind of system creates that kind of patriotism? Well, it's called the U.S. military. So, you know, for all the political conversations that go on about this or that, um, for all those who might be confused about what military members bring, well, let me tell you, it brings, uh, it, it instills in people a sense of deep patriotism and commitment to character that lasts the rest of their lives. And personally, every organization I'm going to lead or be responsible for or involved in going forward in the civilian community. I'm going to have, I'm not saying it's going to be filled with veterans, but you can bet there will be veterans in key places uh, where they're fit to do so because they are an inspiration. We're more, I'm more biased than you are, General. It's odd that I would hire a non-veteran for all of the reasons that you've said. I am utterly inspired in my visits to VA La Jolla. I meet these guys and gals all day long. It takes my breath away, actually. Their positive attitude, the effort they're putting into recovery and convalescence is just astounding. Brings me down to earth. I speak at some of the groups there, and I am just astounded at the audience. It sometimes gets my breath. We, audience and Backpack and I, are eager to hear how your projects go along. In that regard, we'd like to have you back often and love you to keep us updated on what's going on with you and your people, General. 
Absolutely. Well, again, we'll de- certainly find a time to uh, to come back on and, and, and pick up the dialogue there. And what I'd encourage you and and uh, your listeners um, go to go to generalleadership.com. Uh, you'll get exposed. We have great material that's being provided there. You'll see the you'll see mentors matter unfold there. We got a couple other tricks up our sleeves that are coming out too. Um, and so we would encourage you again. This our mantra is you know, leadership advice from America's most trusted leaders. And so we would encourage you, you know, to join us in that journey, uh, you know, follow the flight plan with us and see where it leads. And uh, here's what I promise. Uh, we, we aim to, uh, to add value to everybody who is, you know, affords us the privilege of coming to spend a little time on our webpage. And uh, I also am uh, on Sirius Radio on the Patriot Channel. Uh, General Leadership is the first Wednesday of every month that people want to hear us there with David Webb. So 9 p.m. Eastern time, first Wednesday of every month, uh, one to two hours, we do uh, we talk about these kind of issues and bring some amazing guests. So we're out in the conversation. Follow us on Twitter at Johnny Michelle. You know, uh, and then we'll find a time that I can come back in uh, in the future and uh, Yoda and Backpack pick up where we left this conversation off. But thank you two gentlemen for affording me this great opportunity to connect not just with you, but with all those that uh, to trust you to listen to your channel. General, we're going to feature you on the magnifiedview.com. It's a <clears throat> million viewer magazine. We're getting good response in that. So we'd like to include your material in that as we go along, sir. I I can't thank you enough for your erudite appearance with us tonight, and we're eager to get you back again, Backpack. Yeah, it's been great having you on the show. We also want to tell our listeners to uh, go check out your book called Mediocre Me, and if you'd like to speak a little bit about the book and the process and other books that you're working on. Excellent. Yeah, well, again, that's a great way to kind of uh, transition here. It's uh, Yeah, so... uh, uh, that book I wrote, you know, is my first one, uh, I guess, a couple years ago now. It really just talks about how life settling for good enough, what we call mediocrity, isn't going to get you anywhere inspiring. And it just talks. It's really a basic leadership book, self-leadership book. Uh, I have a new book coming out uh, as well as an entire online learning journal with uh, all the modules that go with it uh, coming out on the, around the 1st of June. It's called The Art of Positive Leadership, Becoming a Person Worth Following. I wrote it in Afghanistan as one of the tools I used to, uh, uh, if you will, kind of ideally uh, empower and maybe even inspire my team out there. And uh, and I'm excited to be able to share it now in in a uh, in book format, you know, through our publisher Thomas the Thomas Nelson uh, Group. And uh, we're very very excited. It's 52 short stories, all of them having to do with how you know, we can lead our lives in a way that equips, encourages, empowers, and inspires others. And when we do those four things very well, well, that's what it means to be a leader. Where can we get the book, again? Uh Where is the book available? The book will not, uh, so The Art of Positive Leadership uh, won't be out until, uh, it'll probably be another couple months. Yeah, I haven't, uh, the publisher is, is still working their final release date. And so that'll be out. You'll see. It'll be up on the Twitter stream, and I've got a PA. we got an agency out of New York. So you'll, you'll see it. It'll be, I think it'll, ideally, if it works the way it's supposed to, it'll be, uh, uh, it'll, it'll be easy to find. And I'll let you guys know once we get, uh, or once we get a pre-release version. Uh, it'll also be up on, uh, on generalleadership.com, and pretty soon johnnymichelle.com will be standing up in the next 30 days, and it'll be there. So I'll send a note out, and I'll contact you guys. Uh, and no more video for me is available in bookstores now, and it's out on Amazon or any of those other ones. You can find that there. It'll be referred to on the magnifiedview.com. Good. Perfect. Well, we want we want to thank you so much for being on Voices of Global Freedom Radio. Uh, you've also been in, involved with a lot of public speaking as well. Do you have a lot of uh, plans in 2015? I have a number of. I mean, I've got keynotes in Houston. I'm speaking to commuter the communicators in uh, in the state of Alabama. I'm in schools. I'm in uh, yes. As a matter of fact, I just returned from North Dakota. Um, so I do have a number of those. That's part of why we're building a site. We'll show where we're at, where, where the different places I'll be speaking across a whole host of topics. So we have again a number of speaking engagements, a radio show, a new book coming out, 
an online journal of one of a kind with 52 models, with everything from, uh, you know, it's gamification to videos embedded. My goal is this, in some, you know, maybe small way, help uh, individuals who are really interested in taking their leadership potential to the next level. I just want to be able to help them do that by sharing a little of my experience and most importantly, a lot of my passion for adding value to our surroundings. So that's why I believe we're here, is to do something to add value to our surroundings as individuals, whatever it is. Not sit around, watch reality shows, and make it about us. Well done, Jeff. Yeah, that's great. Thanks once more for coming on with us. We look forward to knowing you a long, long time. A bunch of emails here. Thank you from the audience as well. You ought to take a break from the frigid north and come out and see us here in Paradise Found, gentlemen. Well, I will. I'll get out there. Like I said, on a speaking engagement or something, I look forward to meeting you too. And then, like you said, we'll we'll book on over and we'll see our amazing hero teammates over at the VA. Thanks, General. Thank you, General. Thank you Thank so you much gentlemen. for being on the show. My pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. God bless you all, and we'll look forward to our next conversation. God, God bless you. All right, well, it's bye-bye. been great having. Thank you. Bye bye. It's bye-bye. been great having John E. Michelle, Brigadier John E. Michelle, on our show. Um, we've got a few minutes closing remarks. Uh, when you get a chance, to all our audience to check out magnifiedview.com. Uh, we've got some of the latest uh, news articles on there. And Yoda, some of the uh, commentary that you'd like to say in a few minutes here, we have. Back to the magnifiedview.com, your article that you've dug up through incredible investigative journalistic skill involves ISIS and Islamic Jihad training camps located throughout America from sea to shining sea. Roy's put a lot of investigative journalistic skills into this, and take a read, you will be amazed. We've started a series on ISIS, Jihad, Muslim, Islamic training camps here in secluded remote areas throughout the United States. You need to be aware of these and what this means to our liberties and our very welfare. I am still struck with a good general's appearance tonight. Wasn't that incredible, Rick? Yeah, this was a great opportunity, a huge honor for us. We were very privileged to have him on the show and uh, look forward to uh, a future relationship with the good general. Backpack, give our audience a word about our new budgeting and growing syndication and our pride in being included in the conservative talk radio directory. Would you brother? Uh, Ricky Robinson, who has the Rowdy Ricky show, he's also uh, one of the managers at K98 Talk and the Spark Radio Network, is now featuring us drive primetime every Friday on the sparkradionetwork.com. We're also really proud to work closely with uh, Ken Kaplan and be on the board of directors with him for toptalkradio.com, which is the conservative directory, all-time top conservative shows. And so we recommend everybody go Take a look at toptalkradio.com. I say again, toptalkradio.com, and it's a great privilege and honor to work with Ken. He was on a recent episode that we had, um, and we've had a lot of really breaking stories on magnifiedview.com and globalfreedomradio.com, many of the things that we're not hearing from lamestream media, but I also encourage our listeners to go check out terrorcamps.com, which is an accumulation of all those articles that look at Muslims of America and what's in our backyard. And we're seeing a lot of that in the coming year, uh, this bring breaking stories about that. So one of some of the many different states, it's surprising that they're from sea to shining sea, that these compounds, which the administration is calling communal living, which in fact are actually a terrorist sleeping cells. So we want to thank you all uh, for tuning in to Voices of Global Freedom Radio, magnifiedview.com. And have a great, great uh, weekend, and God bless.